I can start now. Welcome to another UK Quantum Fluids Network webinar. And today's speaker is Richard Fletcher. He's going to talk about quantum flow physics and the quantum Foucault pendulum. So over to you, Richard. Okay, great. Thanks. Let me go to if I play the presentation. That should should all work. I think we checked this was okay. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the invitation. I understand that this is moved by 24 hours relative to the usual time to fit around my teaching. So I appreciate the flexibility. Um, so great. Yes. So my name is um, Rich Fletcher um, and I'm speaking from, well, across the Atlantic, I guess, um, over at MIT. And so it's a nice opportunity today to tell you something about some of the work which um, has been going on over the last few years um, regarding essentially trying to learn something about the physics of charged particles in a magnetic field, but by using a system of neutral massive atoms in a rapidly rotating frames of reference. Okay. And, and so, um, yeah, I crammed the word quantum into the title as many times as possible. Um, and um, essentially what sets this experiment apart from some of the other rotating gas experiments that have been done in the past is the use of high resolution optical microscopy, which lets you take images such as those shown on the title slide. And so at the moment, these are just some pretty pictures um, from our experiment of um, a quantum fluid, in this case, a Bose-Einstein condensate of sodium atoms in a rapidly rotating frame and doing various weird and wonderful things, which I'll tell you about over the next um, 45 minutes or so. Okay, and so maybe just by way of some broad introduction, um, what we're sort of typically interested in understanding in our sort of line of research is the behavior of what you might call strongly correlated quantum materials. Since these are quantum many-body systems, where correlations between particles give rise to interesting physics. And so in nature, this typically occurs through two different routes. Um, one is that you might have a system in which the interactions between particles are strong. And so an example of that would be something like an, an atomic nucleus, um, or maybe something more macroscopic, such as a sample of liquid helium, or even something astrophysical like a neutron star. In all these cases, you have strongly interacting particles crammed together at large density, um, which leads to correlated physics and the emergence of interesting collective phases. Um, but there's sort of a, a, another route um, in which nature offers us to get to, to similar behaviors, and that's in systems where the kinetic energy has been quenched. And so maybe the most famous example here um, would be if you take electrons and you place them in a magnetic field, folks will remember from undergraduate quantum mechanics that the single particle energy spectrum splits into discrete lambda levels um, each of which hosting a colossal degeneracy of single particle states. And the punchline here is that if you now take a collection of particles and put them into one of these lambda levels, kinetic energy provides no energy scale. You're left with interactions as the only organizing principle, and the particles will reorganize themselves into highly correlated states of matter. Um, and, and historically, this led to you know, really the birth of a new field when this was discovered in the 80s, um, and we might capture under the generic umbrella of the fractional quantum Hall effect. And so it was found that these correlated fluids of electrons gave rise to really extraordinary properties that somehow come out of the correlations that develop between the, between the constituents. And given that I'm speaking from MIT, um, I also have to mention that there are other platforms in which such flat bands give rise to remar remarkable physics. In the last few years, there's seen a lot of excitement um, in the, the, the system of twisted bilayer graphene, which, which Pablo um, sort of kicked off a few years ago in one of the buildings adjacent to ours. And so almost hand in hand, though, with the, the physics or the remarkable physics that comes out of these, these platforms is really an almost fundamental difficulty in understanding how they behave. Um, and depending on which is giving you the most trouble, you might decide that one of these is more problematic. Um, but the point is really that there seems to be a sort of fundamental difficulty in describing such systems analytically. Um, and that is sort of where our experiments try to come in. OK, and so given that the, I figured the audience was maybe a little bit more varied than just a, a, a typical quantum gas, um, seminar. Um, I thought I'd at least put in one picture um, of a quantum gas experiment. Um, and so here it is. There's a, a tremendous number of optics and lasers buried at the center of everything um, is a vacuum chamber in which we trap a sample of atoms and cool it down to nanokelvin temperatures. And so buried in here somewhere, you can take my word for it, there is a little glass cell um, above and below which we have a high resolution um, microscope objective. And we can really use this for two different things. We can either project very intricately sculpted patterns of laser light onto the atoms, or we can use our objective to take high resolution images themselves. And so here is a um, sort of image from the side, and maybe a typical quantum gas image um, of a, about a million sodium atoms um, in a condensed state. It doesn't really look particularly interesting, 
Um, there's a little blob of atoms at the center. But if we now image this thing um, using our high resolution objective, then you see something like this. And so here's an in situ image um, of a Bose-Einstein condensate under rotation. Um, it becomes filled with um, vortices. These are little units of quantized circulation with a density depletion at the center, completely analogous to a rotating sample of liquid helium. Um, and maybe just to, to point out um, one advantage which we have in a quantum gas platform um, is that we can actually resolve the core structure itself of the vortex. And so if you zoom in on one of these things, um, the blue points here indicate the, the density structure of a vortex core where um, the dashed line shows um, what you would expect. That's just, that's just produced by, by numerically solving the gross pusiewski equation in the case of a single vortex. And the solid line is the theoretical profile but convolved with the, M the resolution of our imaging system. Okay, and you can also have some fun with projecting potentials. Um, so here what we're doing is cutting letters um, into a, a Bose-Einstein condensate with an optical resolution of, of much better than a micron. Okay. And so really what you then decide to do with these platforms is up to you. And the point is that you just have an absolutely tremendous level of control over almost every aspect of the gas's behavior. You can play around with the geometry or the dimensionality that the atoms live in. Of course, temperature and density are accessible. Um, the, the strength of interactions are also tunable. And increasingly, we have the ability to vary the range of interactions. One can work with um, atoms interacting via contact potentials, um, or also various forms of long range interaction. And maybe for the, the most salient for the topic of today's talk is our ability to introduce artificial gauge fields. So to persuade these neutral atoms as though they were charged particles um, moving in um, electric and magnetic fields. And so really what one then uses these platforms for is up to your own personal taste. You might use them um, to test existing theory and to provide measurements that theorists can pit their predictions against. Maybe you try to realize some of the paradigmatic phases of condensed matter but then probe them using complementary tools. Or maybe you even try to engineer new states of matter that have perhaps never existed in nature before. Okay. Um, and so the topic of today's talk um, will be a, a, a sequence of experiments which have happened over the last few years, which concern the use of rapidly rotating neutral quantum gases to learn something about the physics of charged particles such as electrons in a magnetic field. And so I'll touch on three different experiments um, the first concerns what we term geometric squeezing. Um, this is quantum mechanical squeezing. So it's a redistribution of Heisenberg uncertainty between non-commuting observables. Um, but rather than being position and momentum or different spin components of a spinful system, it's instead the X and the Y coordinates of particles in a rotating frame. So it's really squeezing um, of a spatial distribution. Um, I'll then move on to, to the second topic, which is, is always a pleasure to talk about because it was an example of the experiment teaching us um, of seeing something that we absolutely didn't understand happening um, in our vacuum chamber, um, and then really having a, a terrific fun over a year or two to understand what was going on. Um, and essentially, one can boil this down to a punchline, which is that um, a condensate occupying a single Lando gauge wave function. So this is a condensate in which all atoms occupy a single eigenstate within the Landau gauge. It turns out this is unstable against any non-zero interaction strength. It will exhibit a spontaneous crystallization, um, which is what's being shown in the image at the center. And then the third experiment I'll touch on is by far the most recent. There's a paper on the archive um, sort of late in 2023, which concerns the realization of so-called chiral edge modes. This is the dissipationless propagation um, of atoms along the boundary of a system when they're subjected to a strong synthetic magnetic field. Okay, and so the history of, of trying to synthesize artificial magnetic fields in cold atoms is really a long one. Um, and, and people have cooked up all kinds of different recipes for doing this, but really whichever your favorite approach is, what you're trying to do is to construct some analog of the Aronoff bone phase. And so at a, at a, for a quantum particle, the, the signature that you are living in a magnetic field is that if you perform a closed loop in space, you pick up a phase proportional to the area of that loop. And the approach that we use to do this is sort of the oldest and maybe conceptually the simplest, and it's to work in a rotating frame of reference. And you can see at various levels, this will do the trick. Um, you know, maybe necessary, but not sufficient. Both of these processes break time reversal symmetry. Okay, thinking more classically, you may realize that the Coriolis force and the Lorentz force both look like velocity crossed with something, where in one case you have charge and magnetic field, and in the other case you have mass and the rotation angular frequency of the frame. 
Um, and more quantum mechanically, as we'll see in a moment, the Aron analog of the Aronoff bone phase is in the case of a rotating frame of reference is provided by the Saniac phase, which is a geometric phase picked up by a massive particle when it performs a closed loop inside a rotating frame of reference. Okay, and so I would point out that people have been spinning quantum gases um, for really quite a number of years, but maybe what sets this work apart is that with the use of this high resolution microscopy, we can now peer directly in situ um, and watch the dynamics of the system without any recourse um, to some kind of assumption in how it would evolve during time of flight imaging, which is how images such as those shown on the slide were typically taken. And it left a lot of the dynamics that were happening actually in situ um, obscure. Okay. Okay, so the title promised um, a Foucault pendulum, um, and here it is. Um, so here is a, a print of Foucault's famous public demonstration. So he hung a great big pendulum from the ceiling of the Pantheon in Paris about 170 years ago. And if you were patient enough to stand there and watch, you would notice that the axis along which the pendulum um, swings would appear to process throughout the day, revealing the rotation um, of the frame in which you're viewing the motion. And so at, at its heart, a Foucault pendulum is really nothing more than a, a 2D harmonic oscillator and viewed inside a rotating frame of reference. We know that rotation couples to angular momentum, and that means that the normal modes of our pendulum are simply a, a circular motion where the pendulum swings co-rotating with the rotation of the frame, and a circular motion where the pendulum swings counter-rotating with the rotation of the frame. And so in an inertial frame, the frequencies of these two modes would be degenerate. They would just be given by omega, um, the natural frequency of the pendulum. But in a rotating frame, their frequencies are split by the rotation rate of the reference frame. Um, and so if you want to figure out the motion of your pendulum, you simply have to add together this slightly faster counter-rotating circular motion and the slightly slower co-rotating circular motion. And if you do that for a relatively slow rotation of your reference frame, the blue shows the slow co-rotating orbits and the red shows the faster counter-rotating orbits, you indeed find that the pendulum swings back and forth along an axis which processes. And if you're Foucault watching this, um, you feel pretty happy. This is a good moment to introduce some coordinates. Um, so we'll turn these fast counter-rotating orbits, cyclotron orbits, with coordinates psi and eta. And these orbits will occur around a point known as the guiding center and with coordinates capital X and capital Y. Okay. But let's imagine for a moment that you had some magical handle where you could crank up the rotation rate um, of the Earth. So now that it's spinning at a much more respectable 0.8 times the natural frequency of the pendulum, you can do the same epicycle construction. But now what you find is a much stranger motion of the pendulum. This would be a lot less intuitive to watch swinging in the Pantheon. Okay, and we can go even further still so the Earth is now rotating at the pendulum's natural frequency. The Bob still has no problem performing these fast counter-rotating cyclotron orbits, but now the centrifugal force on the Bob perfectly balances the gravitational restoring force. And so where you place this cyclotron orbit within 2D space is degenerate. And so without doing any calculations, you realize that once you quantize this system, the energy level must split into discrete lambda levels with each level corresponding to a state of the cyclotron harmonic oscillator and each level hosting a gigantic degeneracy corresponding to where you choose to place the guiding center. And so if you write down a Hamiltonian, it will just consist of the sum of two oscillators, um, one fast and one slow. Um, and maybe just the punchline here um, is that you know already that the, the um, operators corresponding to the phase space variables of a harmonic oscillator form a non-commuting pair. And that means that the cyclotron coordinates psi and eta form a non-commuting pair, the guiding center coordinates x and y form a non-commuting pair. And so, so far this might just seem like some mathematical repackaging, but it has a very physical consequence, which is that if you now apply some potential, some force to your system, which in some sense varies slowly, then it simply can't resolve this fast, short length scale cyclotron motion to a good approximation it couples only to the guiding centers and the particles will move in response within a space that is now non-commutative. So it's very, very different to the inertial space in which we typically um, have our intuition. Okay. And um, we can see already that various very nice properties um, pop out at this level. Okay. And the first I'll highlight is the emergence of the geometric phase that we were after. 
And so if we think first about an inertial frame, we know that the, the, the relevant um, conjugate pairs are X and PX and Y and PY. And that means that the generator of X translations is PX and the generator of Y translations is PY. And so if you take a particle and you ask it to perform a closed loop and ask how its state evolves, you have to stack together four different translation operators. They all commute with each other. And so the particle comes back unchanged. On the other hand, in the rotating frame, the relevant non-commuting pair is now X and Y, the guiding center coordinates, which means the generator of X translations is Y and the generator of Y translations is X. And so now if you again take your particle and move it in a closed loop and ask how its state evolves, you now have to stack together four translation operators which don't commute with each other. And a couple of lines of operator algebra shows you that the particle comes back having picked up a phase proportional to the error of the loop. And this is the phase we're after. Um, in the case of a charged particle in a B field, it would be the Aronoff-Bohm phase. In the case of a massive particle in a rotating frame, it is the Saniac phase. In both cases, it arises because your particle now lives in a space which is non-commutative. We also see our old friend, the Hall response. If we apply a force in the X direction, that's just a potential varying lin linearly with X. And the time evolution operator corresponding to that potential is simply a Y translator. So force along X translates along Y. Um, we can generalize this to the case of a generic potential V because we realize that particles will always locally flow orthogonal to the applied force at a rate proportional to that force. This is just the E cross B drift familiar from electromagnetism. You can also note, it's kind of a, a, a nice aside, that this flow is generically incompressible. And this is sort of a statement of Louisville's theorem because now your real space distribution of atoms is actually a phase space distribution within X and Y. Okay, and so it will always move under Hamiltonian evolution as an incompressible flow. Okay. And maybe the punchline of all of this is that when you apply a completely generic spatial potential to your system, you can always understand the time evolution as a geometric transformation. It's some kind of stretching or um, compression of the space on which the particles are distributed. Okay. So one more um, slide of background before I dive into some experiments and show some, some pictures of real atoms. Um, I will just highlight um, and remind people of the importance of choosing a gauge. Okay, And as a reminder, this occurs because what shows up in the Hamiltonian is not the magnetic field, but what shows up is instead the vector potential. And this necessarily has a lower symmetry than the physical B field itself, which immediately tells you there must be some freedom in how you choose it. Um, and depending on the gauge that you choose, the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian you cook up will reflect its symmetry. And so if, for example, you choose the symmetric gauge where the vector potential flows in circles, the eigenstates that you cook up will reflect that symmetry and be circularly symmetric. If instead you choose the Landau gauge where the vector potential flows up along one half of your system and down along the other half, your eigenstates you cook up will again reflect that symmetry, be translationally invariant along Y and have an X position locked to their Y momentum. Okay, this should be just a refresher from undergraduate. And I'll just show a couple of images here. In fact, in the first experiment I'll mention, we performed a coherent transformation, which um, coherently transforms a condensate from one in which everyone occupies a symmetric gauge wave function into a condensate in which all atoms occupy a single lambda gauge wave function. And so that's what the images on the right are showing. And the way that we achieved that is actually quite simple. Um, in the rotating frame, we simply apply, apply a saddle potential, okay? And at least at the very beginning, we had a very naive image picture of this. We thought, hey, if you apply a saddle, I know what happens in saddles. You should try and roll downhill. Okay, you think the particle should escape along the um, anti-trap direction. And that is completely wrong um, because you're forgetting about the presence of a magnetic field. And the magnetic field causes the particles to do two things. First, they perform cyclotron orbits. And those cyclotron orbits will drift along isopotentials. And if you then do your right hand rule carefully, you'll realize that the particles will flow outward along two diagonals of your system. And quite counterintuitively, they'll flow inward along the other two. It's very strange that if you spin a particle very close to its trapping frequency, or spin a gas very close to the trapping frequency, it, the cloud will dilate along one axis and it will actually compress along the other. And if you stare at this flow profile, you'll realize this is nothing more than squeezing. This is the type of transformation which you would typically draw um, in the, the phase space um, of some oscillator um, in, in quantum mechanics, or maybe it would be, maybe your space would be the, 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 the amplitude you know, and the, um, the phase of an electromagnetic field, or maybe it would be two spin components 
of a spin system, here it's X and Y. Okay, and so the flow profile of the particles is nothing more um, than a squeezing evolution in phase space. So here's a video of that happening. On the left, I'm showing um, a sequence of images in the lab frame. Perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the cloud is, is spinning. Maybe there's something happening, but it's a bit hard to see. If instead you look in the rotating frame, the evolution is much slower and much more controlled, and the cloud elongates along one axis and contracts along the other. Um, I will not go too much into detail in the interest of time, other than to point out that one can formalize this um, a little bit more, and you can show that indeed the Hamiltonian of a rotating system of particles subjected to a saddle potential can be recast as nothing more than a squeezing transformation acting on the guiding center distribution. Uh, maybe just one um, piece of physics I'll highlight um, is if you track the width of the cloud as a function of time, so what I'm plotting here is the, sh the, the minor axis of the cloud as a function of squeezing time, what you indeed find is an exponential decay in the width at early times. That's consistent with a squeezing transformation. But what we find at long times is that width does not go off to zero. It instead saturates at this very suggestive solid black line. Okay, and this has a very nice interpretation, which comes about from noting that our squeezing is only acting on the guiding center distribution. It does not talk to the cyclotron motion. And so in the limit of long time, you have squeezed your guiding centers down to an infinitely extended and infinitesimally narrow distribution, but the, cloud, the, the atoms nevertheless continue to perform cyclotron orbits. And there is a minimum size to these cyclotron orbits set by Heisenberg uncertainty. Another way of saying that is that they, once particles are in the lowest lambda level, that does not mean that the cyclotron orbits have zero extent. They have an extent set by Heisenberg uncertainty arising from the cyclotron coordinates forming a non-commuting pair. And so what we are seeing here um, is a saturation of the, cloud, of the cloud width at a spatial extent set by zero-point cyclotron orbits as particles enter the lowest lambda level. Okay, I'll show you. There's some nice pictures. You can do the same thing with a cloud full of vortices. Um, I won't go into that now. People can check out the paper if they're interested. Okay, so let us move on to the second experiment, um, which is sort of um, follows on very nicely from the last. Um, because what you're left with after performing the squeezing transformation, um, if you think about it a little bit more, you will realize that it's nothing more than a, a, a condensate in which all atoms occupy a single eigenstate of the Landau gauge. Okay, and so that's what this image is showing on the left. Um, I remember sketching these as an undergrad, you know, you ask to diagonalize or, or to find the eigenstates for Hamiltonian under different gauges. If the gauge you choose is the Landau gauge, the eigenstates you cook up are translationally invariant along one axis, and have some small extent along the other. And here is an image um, of a condensate where all atoms occupy one of these. Okay, And this is quite a nice place to be because if you now simply switch off your squeezing transformation, you turn off your saddle, you are left with a system which is extremely simple. There is no confining potential. Okay, the atoms live in an absolutely flat scalar potential, and they are subject to only two terms in their Hamiltonian. There is kinetic energy, which now involves a vector potential because of the presence of a synthetic magnetic field, and there is also interactions between particles. And this interplay between magnetic field and interactions is exactly the thing we'd like to get a handle on. Um, just to convince you a little bit more that what you indeed see is an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, if you explicitly choose the Landau gauge, um, you can now rewrite your Hamiltonian, and it indeed takes the form of a harmonic trap along the x direction, where importantly, the center of that harmonic trap is locked to the Y momentum. That is the manifestation of the magnetic field. Okay. And so eigens various you know, eigenstates of this Hamiltonian are shown on the bottom for different choices of momentum along the Y direction, meaning the trap takes a different position along X. And we have realized a situation where all atoms occupy one of these states. And what was quite surprising to us, this was really an experimental accident, is that if you simply do nothing and watch how your cloud evolves, then what you see is the following, that this, there's a spontaneous development of the snaking instability, and eventually your cloud fragments into a very regular array of droplets. Um, just kind of a nice um, aside, just occasionally two of these droplets meet one another, um, and when they do that, rather than seeing interference fringes between them, which is what you would see if you interfered two condensates in an inertial frame, instead what you see is a vortex street, a line of vortices along the interface. And this reflects the fact that a, a condensate is an irritational object, 
And so in the rotating frame, each of these droplets must host counterflow. There's a circulating flow pattern, which is trying to undo the rotation of the reference frame. So when these droplets meet one another, there is counterflow at the interface, and the interference pattern instead gives you a line of vortices. OK. And maybe in retrospect, we should not have been so surprised um, to see this, um, because if you really forgot everything you knew about quantum Hall physics um, and ask yourself, what should the ground state be of um, repulsive particles with quenched kinetic energy, you might naively say it would be a solid. Okay. Um, and in fact, if you look back at the abstract um, of the paper um, from 82 reporting observation of the fractional quantum Hall effect, this is suggested as a pox possible explanation. But very shortly after that, it was shown that this, in fact, could not describe the observations. Um, and then only a year or so later, um, Bob Laughlin proposed a celebrated wave function describing not a solid, but a correlated liquid. But this competition between liquid and so crystal states still shows up in fractional quantum Hall systems um, in a feature known as the magnetoroton. It's a softening of collective excitations at a length scale set by the magnetic length. And it's sort of a, a hint that the, the, the fluid still remembers it has this tendency to crystallize, even though the correlated liquid is the true ground state. And what's happening in our system is sort of the extreme case where this magnetoroton has hit zero and switched from being a softened but real valued collective excitation to the dynamical instability, or in other words, a collective excitation with imaginary energy. Okay. And so let's try and get an understanding of why this is happening. Um, and as usual, it's good to take some limits. Um, so first, we will um, consider the case where the chemical potential is much smaller than the cyclotron frequency. That means that all atoms are confined to the lowest lambda level. Um, in that case, you can simplify your theoretical description by projecting everything into the lowest lambda level and also performing a Bogolyubov approximation where we exploit the fact that all atoms start in the same state. Okay, this allows us to reduce our quartic initial Hamiltonian to a quadratic one, and you're left with something of the following form. So here, um, A dagger K and A K, this just creates and destroys bosons in a Landau gauge wave function labeled by momentum K. And you have terms of two types. Okay, it's a completely generic quadratic bosonic Hamiltonian. There are terms that look like A dagger A. This just counts how many atoms are in the kth state and assigns an energy cost to that. And there are also terms which look like A dagger K, A dagger minus K. Okay, Physically, what this corresponds to is pair production. It's a, the it's the only thing interactions are allowed to do, where the, the interactions are continually trying to scatter two atoms from the condensate into plus or minus k. That is an, a momentum-conserving scattering process, and it's what's described by the second term. Okay, um, And it is exactly this term in the Hamiltonian which gives rise to something like quantum depletion in a condensate or in liquid helium in an inertial frame. Okay, and so, so there, this pair production term is always weaker than the first energy cost term, nothing runs away in time, but this pair production does give you some virtual population of higher k states and depletes the k equals zero condensate. What we have realized here is that the situation where the weight of these two terms has flipped. Now pair production is actually stronger than the energy cost term, which gives you um, a runaway population or runaway growth in the population of plus or minus k. So you get an exponential growth in the number of atoms in plus or minus k. And there's a very physical understanding of this, which is that um, now that we're in a rotating frame, first you've quenched kinetic energy, which reduces the energy cost to scatter particles into higher K states. But the second is that in a magnetic field, position and momentum are coupled to one another. And so by scattering particles into different momentum states, you also reduce their spatial overlap with the initial condensate, which gives you a sort of interaction energy advantage to doing this. And so together, these two effects um, lead to pair production winning over energy cost, um, and therefore you get an exponential growth in the population of plus or minus k. And if you just think for a moment what this should look like, you now have still some of your atoms in k equals zero, but some coherent admixture of plus or minus k into your wave function. These, of course, have a phase gradient along them. So if you add everything together coherently, what you get is a snake. Of course, you may ask, hang on, this is a quadratic Hamiltonian. I can just diagonalize this um, exactly. That's, of course, true. And what's shown in the bottom right um, is the result of doing that. So this is the, the true collective excitation spectrum um, as a function of wave vector. And what you indeed find 
um, shown by this dashed line is that for a range of wave vectors, um, the excitations have an imaginary energy corresponding to a dynamical instability. One thing I'll point out is that there is only one energy scale here. You're in the lowest lambda level, and so the only energy scale you have to play with is the chemical potential. And that immediately tells you that any dynamics, the, the dynamics of any dynamic or the rate of any dynamical instability can only be set by the chemical potential. Sort of a, a, a consequence of being in the lowest lambda level. Now, if we consider the opposite limit, where now the chemical potential is much larger than the cyclotron frequency, um, so now many, many lambda levels are occupied, okay? Um, and so one should expect to recover classical superfluid hydrodynamics, okay? Another way of saying that is that you should be able to neglect quantum pressure and recover classical hydrodynamics, um, but for a superfluid, okay? Um, and so, um, you know, what is the what does that look like? So we know that the, the velocity or the, the flow profile of a superfluid, typically one associates that with the gradient of the phase of the superfluid wave function. That's sort of an inertial frame result. In the case of a vector potential, there's an extra piece. Okay, And so the flow profile, in fact, looks like the gradient of the phase. But then in addition, you have a contribution from the vector potential. This is sort of necessary to give you a gauge invariant quantity. This flow profile V that we're talking about is sort of the result of an, ex it's, it's something you could measure experimentally. If you dropped a tracer particle into your superfluid and watched how it flowed, um, that is the quantity which we're talking about. If you just had the gradient, the gradient of the phase, this would not be gauge invariant. You have to add this little piece from the vector potential to end with as something that is gauge invariant, okay? And what that means is that even if you are in an eigenstate, so we are starting in an eigenstate of the Lando gauge, which means that the phase is uniform everywhere, the fact that there is a vector potential means there is a flow inside the condensate. And in fact, you know, given that you're in the Lando gauge, if you peered inside your initial condensate, particles would be flowing upward along one half of your strip and downward along the other half. This is a consequence of being a superfluid in a rotating frame. And this type of counterflow within the fluid is very reminiscent of other dynamical instabilities in nature. So for instance, the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability, where you have a counterflow um, of two fluids at some interface. But we also learned that an identical instability to the one we observe also shows up in cyclotrons. It's called the diocotron instability, and it's driven by the, the presence of the B field of the cyclotron and the repulsion, the electrical repulsion between the charged particles of the cyclotron. Um, and so a sequence of, of images of some simulation of this instability is shown in the center. It's absolutely identical um, to our experiment. And in fact, when talking to some of our maths colleagues um, at MIT, it was also pointed out the same instability shows up in the oceans. So if you have what's called a line plume, which is some kind of, imagine like a strip of um, volcanoes on an ocean floor emitting some kind of buoyant fluid. As that strip of fluid rises up through the ocean, the rotation of the earth drives it to, to fragment into distinct droplets of swirling fluid. And so it's quite nice that so this, exactly this instability shows up across about nine orders of magnitude in length scale. In our experiment, though, we can take it all the way to the lowest lambda level. Okay, maybe, okay, there's almost certainly too much maths on this slide. Um, the point is just that in the limit of chemical potential being much larger than the cyclotron frequency, um, what that means is that you can neglect the quantum pressure. It turns out if you do this, that you can always recast your hydrodynamic equations such that the only time scale is provided by the cyclotron frequency and the only length scale is provided by some combination of chemical potential, mass, and cyclotron frequency. Okay. And so maybe now just to offer um, a couple of um, predictions from what we've just discussed, um, the main one I'll highlight is that we expect in the lowest lambda level, the only rate can come about, the only, uh, the only energy scale is chemical potential and therefore the only rate we have is chemical potential over h bar. And so we expect that this crystallization should take place at a rate set by mu. On the other hand, in the limit of high density, h bar can't show up because now we have classical hydrodynamics. And so now the only rate we have to play with is the cyclotron frequency itself. The, the rate should be independent of the interaction strength in the condensate. So now let's actually do some experiments. Um, so the first thing which we can do is pull out the length scale of this emergent crystal. I will not dwell on this other than to point out that we understand this very well. We can track how the length scale of the crystal evolves with um, what's essentially the ratio of the chemical potential to the cyclotron frequency. So as we vary the number of lambda levels admixed into the superfluid wave function, um, we understand well how the length scale of the, the, the dynamical instability varies. 
Um, the, the point I will touch on um, is the plot here shown on the right. So here we can we are directly extracting the evolution, so the, the, the temporal evolution of the structure factor, which allows us to pull out the rate at which this crystal develops. Okay, so what's plotted on the right is the, the, the dynamical instability rate, capital gamma, plotted as a function of how many lambda levels are in your superfluid. It's the ratio of chemical potential to cyclotron frequency. And what we were very pleased to see is that as this number becomes large, you see the data approach the horizontal dashed line, which is the classical result, independent of mu. But as we start to get to a regime of chemical potential becoming of order one cyclotron frequency, you see a departure from this classical result and instead a crossover to a regime where the fragmentation rate is now proportional to mu, which is a smoking gun that you're ent entering the lowest lambda level. Okay. I'll skip this slide. Good. So the final experiment that I want to mention um, is um, the most recent one, um, and it's our efforts um, to realize chiral edge transport in the system. Um, and so what do I mean by that? So let's give a, a couple of slides of background. Um, let's think first classically. We know that if we have a magnetic field and we place electrons into it, these electrons perform cyclotron orbits. Okay, this is a piece of undergraduate electromagnetism. If you now introduce a boundaries to your system, you realize that the chirality of the cyclotron orbits will be reflected in a chirality of the skipping motion along the edges. Every time an electron encounters the edge, it undergoes specular reflection but it can only orbit in one handedness, and that leads to a directional skipping along the boundaries of the system. Okay. So this picture survives first quantization very well. So here I am considering a wall along the X direction. Um, so the wall is translationally invariant along X, and I'll label the momentum along the wall by K. Okay. So a very natural gauge choice to make is the Landau gauge, where the, ga the vector potential is symmetric or translationally invariant along the wall, it reflects the symmetry of the wall. And if you do that, your Hamiltonian takes a very simple form. It looks like a harmonic oscillator where the harmonic trap is along Y, but crucially, the, the center of your harmonic trap is locked to your momentum along the boundary, okay? And so if you stare at this Hamiltonian for a moment, you'll realize there are two very different regimes. If the wave vector K is much less than zero, then the center of your harmonic trap is far in the bulk, the atoms don't explore the edge, and you should recover a flat lambda level dispersion. On the other hand, if your wave vector is much larger than zero, now your effective harmonic trap moves off into the forbidden region of the edge. The atoms cannot follow it. They remain locked at the wall position, which means that they experience a quadratically increasing energy cost in K that arises from the second term in our Hamiltonian. And if you now keep track of your H bars and your Ks and your Ms and so on, without really calculating anything, you expect an energy cost scaling like H bar squared K squared over 2M, which is very familiar um, as, the, as a free particle dispersion. But crucially, this dispersion only shows up for large and positive K. And what that means is that you expect a dispersion relation shown in the bottom right, where in the bulk, you recover the flat bands of electrons in a magnetic field, but the edge necessarily hosts chiral free particles who can only propagate in one direction. And so um, again, this has attracted a lot of interest and excitement um, over the years. Um, I would just point out though that the vast majority of experiments done so far in cold gases made use of what's called synthetic dimensions. And this is um, rather than using two spatial dimensions, using one spatial dimension and one dimension provided by a manifold of internal states of your atom, so some hyperfine manifold of the atom. And this has a great advantage because it naturally provides you a very sharp edge. Okay, a hyper, the man, hyperfine manifold of an atom has some maximum and minimum um, 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 quantum number that it can, um, or maximum minimum um, angular momentum that it can occupy. And so you naturally have a very sharp boundary in the synthetic dimension, but it makes it much harder to explore something like wall structure or the role of interactions. Okay. Um, and so what we're doing here is sort of really the, the, one of the first realizations of edge states um, in real space using quantum gases. But I point out that very, very close to timed with our experiment was a beautiful paper from the Munich group where they realized edge transport not in a rotating system, but in a driven optical lattice. Okay, so how do we do this? So we start off with the geometric squeezing experiment I mentioned at the beginning. So we take a gas um, 
a rotating um, um, condensate, apply a saddle potential in the rotating frame that leads particles to drift outward along the diagonal. Um, and we then we simply apply a very sharp optical wall potential. So we use one of our microscope objectives to project an extremely sharp ring of laser light, which provides a repulsive boundary to the atoms. And so when the atoms meet the edge, they continue to feel an azimuthal force from the saddle that continues to increase their momentum along the boundary. And so this lets you inject particles into a desired wave vector along the edge. Okay. And so what's shown at the bottom is what happens when atoms meet the edge. Um, and indeed, they have started at the center. They have flowed outward along a diagonal. And upon meeting the boundary, they begin to propagate um, in a clockwise direction. Now, we know the dispersion relation um, of our um, edge spectrum. Okay. Um, we also know that um, in the rotating frame, the Hamiltonian is, is time independent, which means energy is conserved. And so by simply knowing how far the atoms have moved azimuthally, so how much has the saddle potential they experience changed, we know by how much they have risen up the, the dispersion relation of the boundary. Okay, And so that lets us map the azimuthal position of the atoms onto a position on the edge dispersion. And then after some propagation time, we can simply switch off the saddle. This freezes the evolution in the azimuthal momentum, and they will subsequently propagate at a fixed wave vector. And the first thing we did um, is just measure their speed. So what I'm showing um, in the bottom right is the propagation of these atoms after removing the saddle. And indeed, they continue to crawl around the boundary of our system. Okay, We can then extract the speed of the wave front as a function of the injected wave vector which allows us to make a plot of wavefront speed against edge mode wave vector. And we indeed recover the dispersion of a chiral of a free particle, except it's, it's now chiral. Okay, so it's a very simple, in a way, a very simple result, but it was really amazing to us to see the free particle dispersion indeed show up at the boundary of our system with a synthetic B field. Okay, this really reminded us of, 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 of this experiment. Okay, this is a, called a wall of death. Um, and so here, this, this motorcyclist is. Um, you know, zooming around the boundary um, of a circularly symmetric system, he does not decay into the center. Um, and the reason that this it put us in mind of, of, of this wall of death is that if you look at the energy of this edge state, it's actually remarkably high. So the highest energy that we can inject, um, it's about 50 um, cyclotron frequencies, which means that it, it's, it's really remarkably excited compared to the states that it came from in the bulk yet energy conservation prevents it from decaying back to bulk states. Um, this edge mode is also very robust. So what I'm showing here is our first attempt to introduce disorder. Um, and so here we've projected, in addition to the optical wall, there is also, we use an optical tweezer to project um, a little repulsive spot of laser light. We then co-rotate this with the rotation of the cloud, such that in the rotating frame, this repulsive potential is static. And you see that as the edge mode reaches it, there's no scattering. Instead, the, the mode flows smoothly around the boundary and goes back to propagating along the wall. OK. And so the final aspect, which I'll touch on, um, is um, our sort of first efforts. Now that we have these edge modes in real space, this opens the door to now exploring not just their propagation, but also their sensitivity to the wall structure itself. OK. And so the simplest you know, case that we want to consider is that of not an infinitely sharp wall, but instead a wall that is linear. Okay, so here we parameterize the wall steepness by a dimensionless quantity alpha, which essentially measures by how many cyclotron frequencies does the wall potential vary by over one magnetic length. Um, and again, it's, it's good to just stare at things before thinking too much and just see how far you can get with, with minimal calculation. You again realize there are going to be two different regimes. If the wave vector of your edge mode is comparable to alpha, okay, with a, some appropriate dimensional de-dimensionalization, you realize that a wave packet of typical extent set by the magnetic length will explore the discontinuity at the wall onset. Okay, And so what that means is that your atoms are exploring the kink. Um, and so as long as alpha itself is much larger than one, it shouldn't really matter whether it's a thousand or a million or a billion. Okay? You should recover hard wall behavior and the propagation of chiral free particles. But on the other hand, this was not obvious to us at the beginning. And as an experimentalist, it's, I don't know if it's depressing or not, but no matter how steep you have managed to make your boundary and how much work you've put into creating a sharp optical wall, you can always find a wave vector 
such that your atomic wave packet will sit only in the linear region. And that's an important statement because a linear potential does not couple cyclotron and guiding centers. And that means that no matter how steep your wall is, you will recover E cross B drift, where the edge mode propagates at a speed proportional to the wall steepness. And furthermore, the, the, the edge um, bands will always be spaced by just one cyclotron frequency. The cyclotron motion does not know about the existence of the wall. Okay. And so, yes, yeah, so and maybe this is the punchline that for, even for arbitrarily steep walls, you will always expect a crossover from hard wall behavior to E cross B drift behavior with increasing wave vector, increasing momentum of the mode along the boundary. And so just to summarize that prediction in a little um, cartoon, what I'm plotting here is the expected speed of the edge mode against the steepness of the wall. And what we expect are two regimes, that for low wall steepnesses, we expect the speed to be proportional to the wall steepness, okay? But once the wall steepness exceeds um, the wave vector of the edge mode, you expect the speed to saturate at the value given by a chiral free particle, so a speed proportional to wave vector itself. And so let us do the experiment. Um, we put some work into varying the steepness of our boundary. Um, what I'm plotting here is the azimuthal position of the edge um, mode against time. You may squint at this and say, okay, it looks a little bit faster um, for the hard wall. Things are a little bit clearer if I make the plot. Um, so what I'm showing here is the extracted wall speed V against edge mode, against edge steepness alpha. And we indeed see a crossover from a regime where these two are proportional to one another and a regime where the speed saturates at a value set by the momentum of the edge mode. Um, I will finally just mention that we can also, from the same measurements, say something about the splitting between edge bands. Just as a reminder, we expect that if the edge mode lives up on the wall, it only experiences a linear potential, cyclotron motion should not be affected, and the bands of the edge dispersion should be split by one cyclotron frequency. On the other hand, if your wave, if your edge mode um, wave packet does explore the force discontinuity at the edge, that does mix cyclotron and guiding center coordinates, and you expect the splitting should change. Okay. We can actually pull this out directly from our data. We can make use of the fact that as our, when our atoms encounter the boundary, they do not encounter it arbitrarily slowly. Okay. They, it turns out that they, they meet the wall. They see the wall from the perspective of a little atomic wave packet. It sees the edge potential switch on in a time which is a little fraction of a cyclotron period. And that means there's a small non-adiabaticity from the point of view of cyclotron motion. And so as the atoms encounter the edge, we do excite a small admixture of the first excited edge band. And what that manifests as is a dipole oscillation. That as the atoms propagate azimuthally, they also oscillate radially. Um, we already know the speed of the edge mode. And so from the azimuthal period of these oscillations, we can pull out the temporal frequency, which is what's plotted in the bottom right. So here we're plotting the temporal frequency of these oscillations against wall steepness. We indeed recover one cyclotron frequency for shallow walls. And as the wall steepness increases, um, this, this coupling of guiding center and cyclotron motion is manifested as this quite substantial increase in the, in the, the frequency of oscillation with respect to the splitting of bands in the bulk of the system. Okay. So that is where I'll wrap things up. Um, um, I will point out the current state of this experiment. Actually, this slide is already outdated. So this image is showing um, a rotating condensate confined in a bucket potential. So now the density, or the, the average density is uniform, but the condensate is riddled with vortices. Um, but actually just in the last few weeks, we also now have single atom detection implemented on this experiment. So we have the ability to perform an experiment in the rotating frame pin all of the atoms in an optical lattice and then measure the location of every atom in the system. That's very, very advantageous for pushing these experiments down to lower atomic densities because where we'd really like to get to a, is a regime where your atomic density is comparable to your flux density. That is the regime in which correlations should start to become important. Um, and it turns out that we'll need um, much better detection of these low densities to do that. And that's why we've implemented single particle detection. I wish I had a, a picture to show. Um, I'd also point out um, a new um, group that I'm currently building up at MIT, um, um, which is um, realizing a degenerate mixture of erbium and lithium atoms. Um, I won't say too much about this other than to highlight various directions we're excited to pursue and to point out we now have very nice magneto-optical traps of both species um, in this experiment. 
um, and are currently pushing these down toward degeneracy. Um, and so with that, I will thank um, all the folks involved um, and of course also the funding agencies and everyone for your attention and sitting through a Zoom talk. Thank you. Hey, thanks, uh, Richard. So now uh, we have time to ask questions. Uh, yep, sorry. Thanks. Parish, hey, um, again. So, um, yeah, I got lost. I have two questions. And uh, I got lost. <laughs> then I stopped following because I was thinking about that stuff. Um, about the sort of you know, the, the the quantumness and the fractional quantumness and yeah. You know, so what is the relationship between this you know dimensionless metric mu over h bar omega c and like the filling factor yeah. in solid state? Yeah, I want... is that is that is that the question? That's the question. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, it's, that's that's actually a great question. I appreciate the question because it gives me a chance to talk about something I didn't have time for on the talk. Um, so for a Fermi gas, okay, then the ratio of chemical potential to the cyclotron frequency, I'm, I'm, h bar is one in that statement. Um, once that quantity is one or smaller, two, there are two two things. You are both in the lowest lambda level. And furthermore, you have a order one electron per flux quantum. Mm -hmm. okay, that's a consequence of Pauli. Okay. Mm -hmm. For a bosonic system, there's another regime. Okay. So, so chemical potential being smaller than cyclotron frequency means that the only states you have available to mix into your condensate wave function are those in the lowest lambda level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you will have you, you expect lowest lambda level physics. That absolutely is distinct to classical superfluid hydrodynamics when you have many lambda levels filled, but you mm -hmm. can still have you know hundreds of bosons per mm -hmm. flux quantum. Yeah. Okay. And so in that sense, your system is still well described by a classical field. Okay, so you can still capture the physics very well via the GP equation. Another way of saying that is that the many body wave function is still essentially all atoms occupying a specific single particle wave function, which you would then associate with the superfluid wave function. Mm -hmm. So that's the regime we're currently in. I'd say that we're the number there is lower than in many prior experiments. So in a lot of the early rotating gas experiments, there were like thousands of atoms per flux quantum. It's very comfortably classical. In our experiment, it's, you know, tens, it depends a bit on the H bar, how, how on the two pies where you count them, but it's, you know, tens to maybe a hundred. So it's maybe an order of magnitude or two better than before, but it's still, everything I showed today could be modeled by the GP equation. And so to say again, that means that in all these cases, the many body wave function is macroscopic occupation of a specific single particle wave function. There's nothing correlated. OK, so to get to correlated physics, which you would be sort of synonymous with fractional quantum wall physics, you need your atomic density to be comparable to the flux density. You need of order one atom per flux quantum. And so that is why we've put in fluorescence imaging. So we, the, the issue with everything I've shown is that we just run out of signal. Once you get to those low densities, absorption imaging just doesn't give you enough signal and you just simply don't see anything. So what we can now do is do this, do these types of experiments but then you switch on a lattice to pin everyone and then just measure where every atom is. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's then, but we are, but we are not, I don't, I don't claim to be in the correlated regime. Can I, can I follow up that? Do you have a green light? I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> we don't have any so, other so race counts. So yeah. These two statements separately, you know, the lowest lambda level uh, and the, and the feeling factor one, right. But I got bugged more mathematically you know the reason the point is started thinking about this and this is like the first half of the talk <laughs> back since yeah is that you had this graph where you know the x axis is mu over omega c okay right and i was looking for a special number i'm like there's only one on that graph you've already passed one and i know that something happens that but it's not the thing i'm looking for right so so in words you can say when the feeling factor is one and i understand it but would like on that graph still use mu over omega c, right? But introduce another dimensionless number and then say like when mu over omega c is less than one, you know, you know, you get this kind of mean field quantum. But when it's less than, 
and then I didn't know what I was looking for. A over L, A over D, L, this is between particles. And what, what is, if I want to keep, you know, the language of one dimensional particle B mu over omega C, what yeah. is the other dimensionless number that it has to, you know, drop below to be in the... In, yeah, I don't, in, I, like, I don't know. If, I, I think that's then species and even... Okay, so... so Maybe the normalize it. Maybe you can at least get rid of the dependence on rotation rate, but it's at least species dependent because what you care about is the, the, the dimensionless number would be num 2D number density of atoms over 2D number density of vortices. Yeah, I know that. Yes. Okay. But, 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 that, but, but, but the mapping from 2D number density of atoms onto mu also depends on, you know, what the, what are the contact potential between the atoms? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that's what I was looking. Is it like your know, scattering length or magnetic length or something? I don't know. I mean, is there some way to to put on the same graph? You know, you you because you could you could just reduce the scattering length, for example, instead of changing the density, right? And yes, your mu yes. over omega would drop. You know, yeah. Even though the density would not change, and yeah, the density so it, yeah. would not change. That, that, yeah, that that's, would actually that's where I got that, lost. That's that, would be, that would be a cleaner what well, you say would be a cleaner experiment, but there's no nice as you know, there's no good flashback resonance. Well, two issues. There's no good flashback resonance for sodium. And furthermore, you're in a magnet. In this case, you're in a magnetic trap, which is chosen because it's so smooth. Um, but it precludes tuning interaction strength. So density is the only handle. So so one right. could plot the line you want. It would be very, it would probably be indistinguishable from the y-axis on the plot I showed, but it's which number it sat at would be different for sodium or rubidium or lithium or whichever species you want to choose. But you see, do you see why I get lost? When I reduce A, mu by reducing A, I'm reducing mu over omega C without changing the density of vortices or the density of particles. So it's possible, so it's possible to reduce mu over omega C without getting closer. Uh, yes, fine, fine. To the correlation regime. That's, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's I, don't, fine. I, don't, I don't think I, I don't think this boundary sits anywhere universal on the plot I showed. Yeah, but I, but in our experiment, we are far, far, far from that regime. Yeah, every, everything is classical field. It's not necessarily classical superfluid hydrodynamics, but it's just, even in the lowest land level, it's describable by a classical field once you add quantum pressure into your hydrodynamic description. Okay, so to keep this limited, I switch to my second question, which is. The, the 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 skipping orbits, you know, the 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 edge modes, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, since undergrad, I have a simple intuition, like, well, you hit the wall, you know, reflect elastically. You're still trying to be chiral in the same sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that that's one thing, and then you know, maybe mm. end of undergrad, beginning of grad school, I understood also like you know how the how the band you know bends near the edge, and instead of thinking of it as a physical wall, which is from a kind of electromagnetism anyway. Yeah, I started thinking it is a forbidden region and so forth. Okay, that's all good. But what has been bugging me throughout the eighty percent of the talk is is what you showed at the beginning, which is what happens with the Foucault's pendulum when you're rotating fast but not quite yeah. at omega. Yeah, yeah and I, there I, is some I, invisible I, boundary, but it still yeah, comes yeah, yeah. With energy and going into the forbidden region. And so I was wondering what the connection is there. It's it's mostly, yeah, fine. I I understand the question. Yeah, it's um. Okay, so I could get into some detail on the first on the first part of your question, but I'll answer the second part first. So, so the, the okay, maybe I can go to it. The motion of the pendulum. This should not be read as an edge state. It, it looks edge statey. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, this guy. Okay. Okay. It's a movie, so I can't play it. Um, the motion of the Foucault pendulum is always an epicycle construction. You add together circular motion going fast one way and circular motion going a bit slower the other way, okay? But now it's like, think back to like classical, you know, how do you solve any classical system via its normal modes? You figure out what the normal modes are, and then you add them together in such a way that it's fixed by initial conditions, okay? How much of each one do you add, and, and what's the amplitude, okay? And so you have to specify the initial condition. And so typically what you could do here is you, you imagine this mo this bob is released from rest in the, in the rotating frame. So you start with a zero velocity and at some radius. That's two pieces of information for the initial condition, and it lets you fix how much of each normal mode do I combine together. And so if you do that, the reason that, if I just play it, the reason that you return, the reason it looks like you bounce is that you are simply returning to 
the initial condition, which was at some radius with zero velocity, but once released, you swing inwards. There's no edge here that you're reflecting from. If you chose different initial conditions, this bob could do, you know, it would look like it was spiraling along the edge. But it is true that you cannot go to high radius because it doesn't have enough energy. And are you 100% yeah. sure there's no link? It cannot get to high radius because it doesn't have energy. Yeah, sure, yes. That's true. <laughs> Which yeah. is the same reason that the particle reflects off the wall. It doesn't have enough energy to go there. But I, I don't see I don't see what the issue you have is because you know it's the same. It, you know, consider instead you, you talk about the infinitely sharp wall and you're happy that there's some specular reflection and you skip chirally, fine. But if you just soften this thing, I mean at some point what you have is just a gently increasing ramp. And so depending on where you sit, you perform cyclotron orbits and you drift orthogonal to the force you feel. That's E cross B drift. Yeah. And so again, that there's always a crossover between what you might call, you know, skipping motion along the edge. So in, in, and in fact, in the in the in the plot we show, this this crossover from edge mode speed being proportional to wall steepness to edge mode speed saturating at K. Classically, you can actually understand this whole plot classically. It's a crossover from E cross B drift along a soft boundary, which is not really an edge at all. It's just living on some slope to skipping um, along um, a wall. And then actually, if you, if, you, if you look closely, the top axis of this plot is F wall over F Coriolis. It's basically the balance of the inward force due to the wall and the outward force arising from Coriolis as the particle propagates along the wall. And so when, when the wall is much weaker than this Coriolis force, the particle can penetrate the soft boundary and what it sees is just a soft edge. But when this wall force exceeds the Coriolis force trying to push it into the edge, now what you get is specular reflection. And so this plot is, there's nothing really, we actually debated whether to, you know, have H bar in this plot at all. Like it, it's, it, you would see this for a classical particle. It's a crossover from E cross B drift of a soft boundary to skipping along a hard boundary. And in the case of the Foucault pendulum, it's it's just a soft boundary. It's, it's in this case, it's not linear. It's something harmonically increasing, but there's still no problem with directional propagation along the edge. No, I don't have a problem. I'm just wondering whether there's further connection to be made with the with the with the with the Foucault. I think yeah. I think the Foucault is living in the left hand region of this plot. Okay, well, thanks a lot, uh, Richard, and thanks a lot, Zorik, for uh, great questions. So I think it's uh, time to wrap up, and uh, well, we're going to have another webinar. I don't remember when, a couple of weeks, I think. Uh, thanks a lot, Richard, for right, coming yeah, here. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.